Okay, we're back at the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Today, it's two narrow escapes. There we go. Remember, Eustace was a dragon for a couple of chapters, and then uh, in the last chapter, he was delivered by Aslan from being a dragon, and he began to be a boy again. He, the cure had begun. So now we're here at this one. Everyone was, everyone was cheerful as the Dawn Treader sailed from Dragon Island. They had fair wind as soon as they were out of the bay and came early next morning to the unknown land which some of them had seen when flying over the mountains while Eustace was still a dragon. It was a low green island inhabited by nothing but rabbits and a few goats, but from the ruins of stone huts and from blackened places where fires had been, they judged that it had been peopled not long before. There were also some bones and broken weapons. Pirates work, said Caspian. Or the dragons, said Edmund. The only other thing they found there was a little skin boat or coracle on the sands. It was made of wide stretched, a hide stretched over a wicker framework. It was a tiny boat, barely four feet long, and the paddle which still lay in it was in proportion. They thought that either it had been made for a child or else that the people of that country had been dwarfs. Reepicheep decided to keep it as it was just the right size for him, so it was taken on board. They called that island, that land, Burnt Island, and sailed away before noon. For some five days they ran before a south-southeast south, wind, out of sight of all lands and seeing neither fish nor gull. Then they had a day that rained hard till the afternoon. Eustace lost two games of chess to Reepicheep and began to get rather like his old and disagreeable self again, and Edmund said he wished they could have gone to America with Susan. Then Lucy looked out of the stern windows and said, Hello! I do believe it's stopping, and what's that? They all stumbled up onto the poop at this and found that the rain had stopped and that Drinian was on watch. Was uh, Drin that Drinian, who was on watch, was all staring hard at something astern, or rather, at several things. They looked a little like smooth, rounded rocks, a whole line of them with intervals of about forty feet in between. But they can't be rocks, Drinian was saying, because they weren't there five minutes ago. And one just disappeared, said Lucy. Yes, and there's not another one coming up, said Edmund. And nearer, said Eustace. Hang it, said Caspian. The whole thing is moving this way. And moving a great deal quicker than we can sail, sire, said Rinian. It'll be up with us in a minute. They all held their breath, for it, was, for it is not at all nice to be pursued by an unknown something, either on land or sea. But what it turned out to be was far worse than anyone had suspected. Suddenly, only about the length of a cricket pitch from their port side, an appalling head reared itself out of the sea. It was all green and vermilions with purple blotches, except where the shellfish clung to it, and shaped rather like a horse's head, though without ears. It had enormous eyes, eyes made for staring through the dip, dark depths of the ocean, and a gaping mouth filled with double rows of sharp fish-like teeth. It came up on that what they first took to be a huge neck, but as more and more of it emerged, everyone knew that this was not its neck, but its body, and that at last they were seeing what so many people have foolishly wanted to see, the great sea serpent. The folds of its gigantic tail could be seen far away, rising at intervals from the surface, and now its head was towering up higher than the mast. Every man rushed to his weapon, but there was nothing to be done. The monster was out of reach. Shoot, shoot, cried the master bowman, and everyone obeyed, but the arrows glanced off the sea serpent's hide as if it was iron-plated. Then, for a dreadful minute, everyone was still, staring up at its eyes and mouth, and wondering where it would pounce. But it didn't pounce. It shot its head forward across the ship on the level with the yard of the mast. Now its head was just beside the fighting top. Still it stretched and stretched till its head was over the starboard bulwark. Then down it came again, uh, began to come, not onto the crowded deck, but under the, into the water, so that the whole ship was under an arch of serpent. And almost at once that arch began to get smaller. Indeed, on the starboard side, the sea serpent was now almost touching the Don Treader's side. Eustace, who had really been trying very hard to behave well, Till the rain and chest put him back, now did the first brave thing he had ever done. 
He was wearing a sword that Caspian had lent him. As soon as the serpent's body was near enough to, on the starboard side, he jumped up on the bulwark and began hacking at it with all his might. It is true that he accomplished nothing beyond breaking Caspian's second-best sword to bits, but it was a fine thing for a beginner to have done. Others would have joined him if that, at that moment Reepicheep had not called out, Don't fight! Push! It was so unusual for the mouse to advise anyone not to fight that, even in that terrible moment, every eye turned to him, and when he jumped up on the bulwark toward the forward of the snake and set his little furry back against its huge, scaly, slimy back, and began pushing as hard as he could. Quite a number of people saw what he went, meant and rushed to both sides of the ship to do the same. And then a moment later, the sea serpent's head appeared again, this time on the port side, and this time with its back to them. Then everyone understood. The brute had made a loop of itself around the Don Treader and was beginning to draw the loop tight. When it got quite tight, snap! There would be floating matchwood where the ship had been, and it could pick them out of the water one by one. There was only chance, their only chance was to push the loop backward till it slid over the stern, or else, to put the same thing another way, to push the ship forward out of the loop. Reepicheep alone had, of course, no more chance of doing this than of lifting up a cathedral, but he had nearly killed himself with trying before others shoved him aside. Very soon the whole ship's company, except Lucy and the mouse, which was fainting, was in two line, tall, two long lines along the two bulwarks, each man's chest to the back of the man in front, so that the weight of the whole line was in the last man, pushing for their lives. For a few sickening seconds, which seemed like hours, nothing appeared to happen. Joints cracked, sweat dropped beneath came, a breath came in grunts and gasped. Then they felt that the ship was moving. They saw that the snake loop was further from the mast than it had been, but they also saw that it was smaller, and now the real danger was at hand. Could they get it over the poop, or was it already too tight? Yes, it was just fit. It would just fit. It was resting on the poop's rails. A dozen or more sprang up on the poop. This was far better. The sea serpent's body was so low now that they could make a line across the poop and rush side by side. Hope rose high till everyone remembered that the high carved stern, the dragon tail of the Dawn Treader. It would be quite impossible to get the brute over that. An axe, cried Caspian hoarsely, and still shove. Lucy, who knew was, uh, who knew where everything was, heard him where he was standing in the main deck, st staring up at the poop. In a few seconds, she had been below, got the axe, and was rushing up the ladder to the poop. But just as she reached the top, there came a great crashing noise, like a tree coming down, and a ship rocked and darted forward. For at that moment, very moment, whether because the sea serpent was being pushed so hard or because it foolishly decided to draw the noose tight, the whole of the carved stern broke off and the ship was free. The others were too exhausted to see what Lucy saw. There, a few yards behind them, the loop of the sea serpent's body got rapidly small and disappeared into a splash. Lucy always said, but, of course, she was very excited at the moment, and it may have been only imagination, that she saw the, a look of idiotic satisfaction on the creature's face. What is certain is that it was a very stupid animal, for instead of pursuing the ship, it turned its head round and began nosing all along its own body as if it expected to find the wreckage of the Don Treader there. But the Don Treader was already well away, running before a fresh breeze, and the men lay and sat panting and groaning all about the deck till presently they were able to walk, talk about it, and then to laugh about it. And when some rum had been served out, they even raised a cheer, and everyone praised the valor of Eustace, though it hadn't done any good, and of Reepicheep. After this, they sailed for three days more and saw nothing but sea and sky. On the fourth day, the wind changed to the north, and the seas began to rise. By the afternoon, it had nearly begun, become a gale. But at the same time, they sighted land on their port bow. By your leave, sire, said Rinian. We will get try to get under the lee of that country by rowing and tot lie in harbor, maybe, till this is over. Caspian agreed, but a long row began against the gale didn't bring them to the land before evening. By the last light of that day, they steered into a natural harbor and anchored, but no one went ashore that night. In the morning, they found themselves in the green bay of a rugged, lonely-looking country that which sloped up to a rocky summit. From the windy north, beyond that summit, clouds came streaming rapidly. 
they lowered the boat and loaded her with as many any of the water casks which were now empty. Which stream shall we water at, Drinian? said Caspian as she took as he took his seat in the stern sheets of the boat. There seemed to be two coming down into the bay. It makes little odd, sire, said Drinian, but I think it's a shorter pull to that one on the starboard, the eastern one. Here comes the rain, said Lucy. I should think it does, said Edmund, for it was already pelting hard. I say, let's go to the other stream. There are trees there, and we'll have some shelter. Yes, let's, said Eustace, but no point in getting wetter than we need. But all the time, Drinian was steadily steering to the starboard. Like tiresome, tiresome people in cars who continue at 40 miles an hour while you are explaining to them that they are on the wrong road. They're right, Drinian, said Caspian. Why don't you bring her head around round, and make for the western stream? As your majesty pleases, said Drinian a little shortly. He had had an anxious day with the weather yesterday and didn't like the advice from landsmen. But he altered course and it turned out afterwards that it was a good thing he did. By the time they had finished watering, the rain was over and Caspian with Eustace, the Pevensies, and Rippy Chief decided to walk up the hill, top of the hill, and see what could be seen. It was a stiffish climb through coarse grass and heather, and they saw neither man nor beast except seagulls. When they reached the top, they saw that it was a very small island, not more than twenty acres, and from this height the sea looked larger and more desolate than it did from the deck or even the fighting top of the Badon Treader. Crazy, you know, said Eustace to Lucy in a low voice, looking at the eastern horizon, sailing on and on into that with no idea what we may get to. But he only said it out of habit, not really nastily, as he would have done at one time. It was too cold to stay long on the ridge, for the wind still blew freshly from the north. Don't let us go back the same way, said Lucy as they turned. Let's go along a bit and come down by the other stream, the one Drinian wanted to go to. Everyone agreed to this, and after about fifteen minutes they were at the source of the second river. It was a more interesting place than they had expected, a deep little mountain lake, surrounded by cliffs except for a narrow channel on the seaward side, out of which the water flowed. Here at last they were out of the wind, and all sat down in the heather above the cliffs for a rest. All sat down, but one, it was Edmund, jumped up again very quickly. They go in for sharp stones on this island, he said, groping about in the heather. Where is the wretched thing? Oh, now I've got it. Hello. It wasn't a stone at all. It's a sword hilt. No, by Jove, it's a whole sword. What the rust has left of it. It must have lain here for ages. Narnian, too, by the look of it, said Caspian, as they all crowded round. I'm sitting on something, too, said Lucy. Something hard, it turned out to be the remains of a mail shirt. By this time, everyone was on hands and knees, feeling on the thick heather in every direction. Their search revealed, one by one, a helmet, a dagger, and a few coins. Not Callum and Crescents, but genuine Narnian lions and trees, such as you might see any day in the marketplace of Beaver's Dam or Baruna. Looks as if this might be all that's left of one of the seven lords, said Edmund. Just what I was thinking, said Caspian. I wonder which it was. There's nothing on the drag dagger to show, and I wonder how he died. And how we are to avenge him, added Reaper And how we are to avenge him, added Reaper Chief. Edmund, the only one of the party who had read several detective stories, had meanwhile been look thinking. Look here, he said, there's something very fishy about this. He can't have been killed in a fight. Why not, asked Caspian. No bones, said Edmund. An enemy might take the armor and leave the body. But who ever heard of a chap who'd won a fight carrying away the body and leaving the armor. Perhaps he was killed by a wild animal, Lucy suggested. It'd be a clever animal, said Edmund, that would take a man's male shirt off. Perhaps a dragon, said Caspian. Nothing doing, said Eustace. A dragon couldn't do it. I ought to know. Well, let's get away from this place anyway, said Lucy. She had not felt like sitting down again since Edmund had raised the question of bones. If you like, said Caspian, getting up. I don't think any of this stuff is worth taking away. They came down and round to the little opening where the stream came out of the lake and stood looking at the deep water within the circle of cliffs. It had been a hot day. No doubt some would have been tempted to bathe and everyone would have had a drink. Indeed, even as it was, Eustace was on the very point of stooping down and scooping up some water in his hands when Reepicheep and Lucy, both at the same moment, cried, Look! And so he forgot about his drink and looked into the water. The bottom of the pool was made of large, grayish-blue stones, and the water was perfectly clear, and on the bottom lay 
a life-size figure of a man, made apparently of gold. It lay face downwards with its arms stretched out above its head, and it so happened that as they looked at it, the clouds parted and the sun shone out. The golden shape was lit up from end to end. Lucy thought it was the most beautiful statue she'd ever seen. Well, whistled Caspian, that was worth coming to see. I wonder, can we get it out? We can dive for it, sire, said Reaper Cheap. No good at all, said Edmund. At least if it's real gold, solid gold, it will be far too heavy to bring up. And that pool's 12 or 15 feet deep if it's an inch. Half a moment, though. It's a good thing I've brought a hunting spear with me. Let's see what the depth is like. Hold on to my hand, Caspian, while I lean out over the water a bit. Caspian took his hand, and Edmund, leaning forward, began to lower his spear into the water. Before it was halfway in, Lucy said, I don't believe the statue is gold at all. It's only the light. Your spear looks just the same color. What's wrong? asked several voices at once, for Edmund had suddenly let go of the spear. I couldn't hold it, gasped Edmund. It seemed so heavy. And there it was on the bottom now, said, said Caspian. And there it is on the bottom now, said Caspian. And Lucy is right. It looks like the same color as the statue. But Edmund, who, who appeared to have be having some trouble with his boots, at least he was bending down and looking at them, straightened himself all at once and shouted out in a sharp voice with people hardly ever disobey. Get back, back from the water, all of you, at once. They all did and stared at him. Look, said Edmund, look at the toes of my boots. They took a bit, they look a bit yellow, began Eustace. They're gold, solid gold, interrupted Edmund. Look at them, feel them, the leather's pulled away from it already, and they're as heavy as lead. By Aslan's Gaspian, you don't mean to say, yes, I do, said Edmund. That water turns things into gold. It turned the spear into gold, and that's why it was so heavy. And it was just lapping against my shoe, my feet. It's a good thing I wasn't barefoot. And it turned the toe tip, toe caps, into gold. And that poor fellow in the bottom, well, you see. So it isn't a statue at all, said Lucy in a low voice. No. The whole thing is plain now. He was here on a hot day. He undressed on the top of the cliff where we were sitting. The clothes have rotted away or been taken by birds to line nests with. The armor's still there. Then he dived in and... Don't, said Lucy. What a horrible thing. And what a narrow shave we've had, said Edmund. Narrow indeed, said Bibi Cheap. Anyone's finger, anyone's foot, anyone's whisker, or anyone's tail might have slipped into the water at any moment. All the same, said Caspian. We may as well test it. He stooped down and wrenched up a spray of heather. Then very cautiously he knelt beside the stream and dipped it in. It was heather that he dipped. What he drew out was a perfect model of heather made of the purest gold, heavy and soft as lead. The king who owned this island, said Caspian slowly, and his face flushed as he spoke, would soon be the richest of all the kings of the world. I claim this land forever as a Narnian possession. It shall be called Goldwater Island, and I bind all of you to secrecy. No one must know of this, not even Drinian, on pain of death. Do you hear? Who are you talking to, said Edmund? I am not such no subject of yours. If anything, it's the other way round. I am one of the four ancient sovereigns of Narnia, and you are under the allegiance to the High King, my brother. So it has come to that, King Edmund has it. So Caspian, said Caspian, laying his hand on his sword hilt. Oh, stop it, both of you, said Lucy. That's the worst of doing anything, you with boys. You're all such swaggering, bullying idiots. Oh, her voice died away into a gasp, and everyone else across saw what she had seen. Across the gray hillside, above them, gray, for the heather was not yet in bloom, without noise and without looking at them, and shining as if he were in bright sunlight, through the sun had in fact gone in, Though the sun had in fact gone in, passed with slow, passed with slow pace the hugest lion that human eyes have ever seen. In describing the scene, Lucy said afterwards he was the size of an elephant. Though at another time she only said the size of a cart horse, but it was not the size that mattered. Nobody dared to ask what it was. They knew it was Aslan, and nobody ever saw how or where he went. They looked at one another like people walking, waking from sleep. Well, what were we talking about, said Caspian? Have I been taking rather, making rather an ass of myself? Sire, said Reaper Cheap, this is a place with a curse on it. 
Let us get back on board at once, and if I might have the honor of naming this island, I call it Deathwater. That strikes me as a very good name, Reap, said Caspian. Though now that I come to think of it, I don't know why. But the weather seems to be settling, and I dare say Drinian would like to be off. What a lot, what a lot we shall have to tell him. But in fact, they had not much to tell him, for the memory of the last hour had all become confused. Their majesties all seem a bit bewitched. When they came aboard, said Drinian to Rents, some hours later, when the Dawn Treader was once more under sail, and Deathwater Island already below the horizon. Something happened to them in that place. The only thing I could get clear was that they think they found the body of one of those lords we're looking for. You don't say so, Captain, answered Rents. Well, that's three, only four more. At this rate, we might be home soon after the new year. And a good thing, too. My backy's running a bit low. Good, good night, sir. That was a little scary. And there we are. That was the two narrow escapes. More tomorrow. Bye-bye.